Hey, Hawkeye fans, Chad Lysico here of the Des Moines Register, week two of our YouTube podcasts, uh, which you can still find on other platforms. But uh, that, we've gotten really good feedback, Kennington Smith, uh, from our first two, I would say. I mean, there's a lot to talk about with Iowa football right now, <laughs> despite not being able to score a touchdown. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, they've they've kind of been a punchline, I think, in college football this week. Uh, you know, but they did get the win. But uh, anyway. I think that I th I, I'm excited about continuing the YouTube stuff. Uh, I've gotten good feedback. I don't know about you. Yeah, I've gotten good feedback too. I think that my only negative feedback is that I need to smile more. So <laughs> maybe I'm um, too melancholy when we when we get on here on these platforms. But I'm enjoying it, and this has been fun, and the feedback has been been great. And I enjoyed that we had a lot of people on our live show after the game submitting questions and all of that. So I'm really hoping that that's something that really catches fire and we can really get interactive and have some fun, uh, more fun than we did last Saturday on our post-game shows. So um, here's to, to week two. Yeah, to be fair, you know, last Tuesday, our very first one was like, the sky is falling with wide receiver injuries. And then the game itself ended up uh, a little bit ugly on the offensive side of the ball, a little unsatisfying, I think. Uh, uh, regarding the final score, but the Hawkeyes did win 7-6 against South Dakota State. Sets up the Cyhawk uh, week, and uh, that leads us, Kennington, uh, for those that missed it, kind of our format on these Tuesday shows. We're going to go about 10 minutes each on three topics, three downs, uh, and just take you to, with a, into the finish with a 30-minute podcast. So topic one, hmm, what should we talk about? What should we talk about? Uh <laughs> Pro probably something offensive. Uh, okay, sure. <laughs> uh, so number one, first down, first down, uh, first and ten here. Uh, what would it take, Kennington Smith, for Kirk Ferentz to turn to Alex Padilla either this Saturday or at some point? What would it take? I think it's going to take another catastrophically bad performance and one and a half similar to what we saw on Saturday. I don't have the numbers exactly in front of me, but I believe Iowa had only 56 ish yards of total offense. There was a turnover in there as well from Spencer Petrus. I think that especially in a game like this where Iowa State, at least in my opinion, is considerably more dangerous than South Dakota State. If you find yourself in a situation where there are turnovers where there are drives not being sustained, especially if they have favorable field position like they had last Saturday with their average starting field position being their own 43, basically at midfield and not being able to sustain drives and score points. If you find yourself in a situation like that going into to halftime where you haven't gotten anything done on offense, maybe you're losing the turnover battle, the game might be tied six to six or seven to seven, or you might be down 10 to three or something like that. And there's just no spark on the offense. I feel like at that point, you're going to have to turn to Alex Padilla just to, to see if he can provide something new to, to the offense. I know that we've talked a lot about his ability to create with his legs, with the offensive line kind of in flux. Maybe that could be um, a different element that he could bring to the offense, or even if he's not running the ball, maybe extend some plays and, and leave some time open for, Arlen Bruce or Alec Wick or, or Brody Brecht, whoever's out there at receiver to, to get open and make a play. So that's, you know, kind of where I'm at with um, Spencer and how long his leash should be. Um, you know, if you don't see anything tangible after a half, I feel like you've given him enough chances to um, to show that he's uh, the rightful starting quarterback. Chad, you're muted. Yeah. We talked about this. There we go. I was, there were sirens outside, so I was like trying to like make it, uh, you know, better, and I messed up there. Sorry about that. Yes, I went back. Uh, yeah, we talked about a little bit on our post game show about uh, you know Kirk Ferentz with that gut feeling last year against Nebraska. Of course, that was to bring Petrus in for Padilla, but uh, I think the I don't know the the thing that's racing through my head, and I don't even know how to write this necessarily. So it's probably better to talk about it this way. But like. You know, is there almost at some point, at some point, if the thing, if things aren't going well for the offense on Saturday, we heard the booze the other day. We heard the booze. You don't, don't you, if you're Kirk Ferentz, you almost have to, you have to turn the page just for the Spencer's sake. I mean, he, <laughs> they, right. you, can't, you can't, you really can't keep trotting him out there if things just aren't going well. And, and he said, you know, they like two quarterbacks. So, 
Um, I totally get it. I get it um, from where he's sitting because you look back at last year's Citrus Bowl, and I'm working on a column tonight on this topic, but they had their highest yards per play in the Citrus Bowl, 6.4, of all of last season. So I feel like they think they were on the right page. Obviously, didn't have Gavin Williams in this one. You know, we're going to talk about in our third topic, the O-line wasn't there yet. So I think they just want to see this through a little longer than one game, uh, a game they won. But, uh, yeah, the uh, the numbers are pretty ugly, obviously. Uh, I think it's the – I've just charted it. I'm going to get it in my column, but I think this was the second lowest yards per play of the Brian Ferentz era. The only one higher in a game was – or one, only one worse in a game was the – the infamous 2017 game at Wisconsin when I had 66 total yards on 50 plays. So that's a tough bar. I don't think that'll ever be crossed, but anyway, it's uh, I don't know. What do you think about that? I mean, is it, and then on the flip side, is it for the people that want Padilla or a change, you know, do you kind of secretly want some struggles in the first half? I know that's crazy to bring up, but I, I think there's probably a segment of fans out there that just secretly want the team to struggle, so they have to make that change. Yeah, I think that, well, on the first point, speaking about Kirk and the staff, mm-hmm. I definitely think there is, um, at, if it gets to a, a dire point in the game, I think there is a certain responsibility to just turn the page and see what you have behind Spencer. Because as you've said, this isn't a situation where you have Spencer who has all this program equity and he's just so far ahead of number two. Kirk Ferentz has said on several occasions that he feels like he has two quarterbacks that they can win with, and they have done that previously. I mean, Padilla, if you you guess, I guess you technically can't count Northwestern as a start, but that was a, a Padilla game. And right. I, I mean, he was um, undefeated at, as a starter, and they wouldn't have won the Big Ten West Championship without right. him. So he has been um, an integral part of the offense at, at different points. So I feel like you you have to kind of stand on your word a little bit if there is a situation like that where you put Padilla in the game. And I think for the fans, it's starting to to kind of drift from this frustration with Spencer and it's starting to kind of drift over to the coaching staff because at the end of the day, Spencer isn't trying to play bad and he's not in control of if he starts or not. Like you said, Kirk and Brian, they're putting him out on the field. They keep trotting him out there. So they're the ones who are holding all of, the, the, the power in that in that case. And I think that, um, you know, it's on them to, to make that call ultimately. As far as the fans and kind of um, a want to see something different, I know we talked about this also earlier today, kind of like is winning an, an enemy of, of progress in a way. I think that um, the way that – the vibe that I got from the fans after the game – was they're going to take offensive success any way that it can come. So mm-hmm. if Spencer goes out there and plays well in the first half, and let's say I was just rolling on all cylinders, they're up 17 nothing at halftime, I think that they're going to be completely cool with um, with letting it, it ride out with him. But I feel like their patience for that is going to be way slimmer than what it was last Saturday. I think that on Saturday's game, you know, one, three and out, two, three and out. So it's like, okay, the game is just starting. They'll settle down. They'll get into it. But once you start getting into like mid-second quarter, it's almost halftime. There's still not anything generated on offense. That's when I felt like the booze really started to rain in. I feel like there's going to be a much shorter fuse this week around just knowing what they saw last week um, and just kind of all the conversations uh, about the first point and how much confidence they say they have in Padilla. I think the fans are going to want to see that come to fruition if the offense struggles early on on Saturday. Yeah, and I guess what, uh, you know, we're obviously doing this podcast on Tuesdays uh, after we talk to players, after we talk to Kirk Ferentz, uh, Spencer Petras, probably, you know, a good 15 minutes uh, of conversation today. And, and his theme was, you know, he didn't want to talk about last week. And he's done that a few times when there's been rough games. I, I can't remember which game it was last year. I'm guessing it was after the Purdue game. Uh, you know, where he just didn't want to talk about that game anymore and move on. And, uh, you know, their focus is on Iowa State. And you have to – I mean, Kirk Ferentz said after the game, we're going to be better next week. Uh, That's that's the common theme from everybody is that there were a lot of reasons for the failures. Um, But as I kind of outlined in my DVR Monday, it's really hard not to to see, you know, the quarterbacks – 
hand in all of this. I mean, he definitely had uh, probably the biggest percentage of uh, cause for failed plays. So, you know, they didn't lose the game. He gets another chance. But um, to me, yeah, you can – because they're at home especially, I think that that, that clock's going to speed up because the fans aren't going to let him keep playing <laughs> the same guy if things yeah. are, are, are going poorly. And then, uh, you know, but on the flip side, let's say Petrus Kennington has an okay game. Let's, I mean, let's say he's like, uh, yeah, 15 for, I mean, 15 for 27 for 145 yards. That's not, that's not great by any means, but Iowa wins, I don't know, 20 to 13. I mean, he's basically going to have the next two starts, right? I mean, so um, it's just kind of interesting to, that's just the, maybe the most interesting game of the quarterback battle is this Saturday, because really the Nevada game is going to tell us anything about right. the quarterbacks. Right. I mean, if you yeah, go to, if you go to Padilla now, then Padilla gets that Nevada game to go into Rutgers and, and so forth. And then you got Michigan. So this is a huge game this week for the quarterback position is what I'm saying. Yeah. 100%. And just going to the point about Spencer saying he doesn't want to talk about last week, I understand it completely. I mean, we all saw the game. We saw what happened. It was bad. Let's talk about solutions. Yeah. I think, right. I, I think that's where his mind is at, and I feel like that's where everybody's mind should be at. We saw it. We saw what happened. It obviously wasn't great. There weren't many positive takeaways. What is Iowa doing to rectify that for this Saturday? All right, uh, good stuff. Uh, we'll we'll talk more about the offense. I bet uh, just just a hunch on Wednesday night's radio show uh, on KXNO six to seven p.m. Wednesday night. Uh, second down, Kennington. Uh, unfortunately, some some difficult injury news to discuss. You know, the injuries were such an off season topic back in the spring, then in fall camp, uh, <laughs> game day morning, down to two scholarship receivers. And unfortunately, the attrition has gotten even worse. We saw Justin Jacobs limp, limp off the field last week. He did not return after the first half. Um, news does not sound good on him, but also another real key defensive injury. Go ahead. Yeah, Y Black, who played really well against South Dakota State. I think he had um, maybe close to 20 snaps before he went out, but he injured his foot, and he'll be out for a few weeks is what yeah, it looks like. Tough so, one. Big blow on the defensive line. Elsewhere, Jamari Harris is still out. He's Kirk Ferris said he's very doubtful, but very doubtful plus not being on the depth chart. I mean, he's probably out. We can just say that, that he's out. Um, so there is some, some missing pieces um, on the defense. I think that the, the fortunate thing, if there is something fortunate about injuries, looking at the linebacker position, because all three starting linebackers were out during spring and all three of their backups went through an entire spring practice with the first team, I think that they're in a much better position to mitigate that blow. Obviously, Justin is somebody who um, is an NFL-level talent, but you got to go back to the Saturday and feel good about what Logan Clem did in his place. I mean, the defense really didn't drop off after Justin was out. Jamari was out for the, the first game, but Terry Roberts and Cooper DeGene, I think, played very nicely at the, the cornerback spot, and Cooper has some position versatility as well. And I think that Wise injury, while it is really big, he was kind of like that space eater type. You have that, um, you know, Aaron Graves right there. He didn't play on Saturday. That's somebody that the coaches have said have really impressed. And I think this might be an opportunity for him to play, um, as well as Louis Steck, who is officially listed and why he's placed on the depth chart. Lots to discuss there. Um, uh, we will get to the injuries on the offensive side of the ball, I promise, in the back end of this 10 minute uh, down. But uh, yeah, the linebacker uh, thing in my head is, you know, I think Clamp, and they also, we also saw Kyler Fisher out there on Saturday, kind of also playing on that. Um, combination there with Campbell and Benson. But, uh, you know, I think one thing Seth Wallace talked about was Campbell and Benson both could play that outside linebacker as well if they do go 4-3. So I just wonder, Kirk Ferris just alluded, it, alluded to it just a little bit. Um, could we see Jay Higgins potentially? He didn't say Higgins' his name, but I'm saying could we see Jay Higgins uh, maybe even playing one of those inside positions and maybe have even a Campbell – you know, move outside if, you know, to guard a tight end, whatnot, um, or Benson 
to maybe just be a little bit, bit bigger on the edge in that 4-3 and have Higgins and Campbell inside. So I think uh, that gives them a lot of options in the 4-3. That being said, I think this is going to be a heavy 4-2-5 day. And I think you're just – which is good for Iowa. That's a good – because then that gets you DeGene, Roberts, who looked great in week one. Uh, Quinn Schulte in the back end looked great. And uh, and then, of course, Riley Moss on the other side, who's – you know, this, this would be a huge game for him going against Xavier Hutchinson. We'll get into that matchup more on the, the Hawks as a radio show. But I think – for this week, I think they're okay at linebacker, but the Jacobs injury is not good because he gives you depth. He gives you a really good player, a future NFL player, and he's he's going to save mileage on the tires, we think, of Campbell and Benson. But in particular, Campbell, you cannot lose Jack Campbell. Uh, I mean, he is he may be the most irreplaceable guy on the team. Just he was so good the other day. And uh, and I think with the YA Black um, – do we see Lucas Van Ness slide back inside a little bit? Start Suddenly, Joe Evans looks like an every-down guy. Um, John Wagner played really well. Ethan Herkett and Deontay Craig both played the other day. So, I mean, they're they're flush at defensive end. Maybe Van Ness comes back inside for a few on Saturday. Yeah, and I think that <clears> – excuse me, Van Ness at, at the inside maybe carrying um, a larger load, um, you know, snap-wise will end up being a, a good thing. You think about – the challenge of facing Hunter Deckers and kind of how he's that that dual threat quarterback, you start thinking about the different type of pass rushing packages that you could put out there, um, you know, with four linemen and, and still keep your, your same alignments if you have like a Evans and a Van Ness inside and Deontay Craig all on the end as well. Maybe Ethan Herkett also like you, you're going to have some some pass rush options. I think that you know, Coach Bell and Neiman have done a really good job developing that room. And I think this goes back to an availability we had in July where Logan Lee said that he was talking to somebody and he said, I think we could travel a dozen defensive linemen for a road game, which, um, you know, if you don't know, they they travel significantly less players than that dress out for, for a home game. So to yeah, say that 10, you could, usually 10, yeah. yeah. So to say that you could carry um, a dozen of, of one position on that D-line um, says a lot about – the the depth so why black is, is a big loss but i'm interested to see maybe who steps into that role um and maybe kind of the the creativity that that bell and neiman get a chance to, to play with with him out yeah be an interesting backup defensive tackle duo of van ness and graves that would be like the hercules duo <laughs> <laughs> the muscle bound men inside um so anyway uh, let's move on to the offensive side of the ball kennington um with the injury situation a wide receiver uh, to me, unfortunately, listening to Kirk Ferris today, there's not going to be any help on the way this Saturday against the Cyclones. Uh, the good news is Alec Wick and Arlen Bruce the Fourth, uh, we think, made it through healthy. Uh, you know, I'd certainly like to see a little bit more from Iowa going to Wick uh, on, on Saturday. I only tried to get to it with the ball to him once, but yeah, uh, you know the. Kind of a strange answer, wasn't it, from Kirk Ferris today on Keegan Johnson and kind of a concerning answer. Uh, we've heard it's a, a hamstring injury for Keegan, and, you know, hamstrings can linger. You know, how severe is it? Uh, you know, I think it's it's always, uh, you know, how much can you push through it, and it's hard as a receiver to push through a hamstring. So uh, right now it's uh, uncertain when Keegan Johnson is going to come back, and I think a lot of people thought he was going to play the opener. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, the the line of questioning was, and I'm paraphrasing here, was something to the effect of, is Keegan Johnson going to play? Kirk was like, nah, he, he's not practicing, but he is with the team. The next question was, is there, you know, when do you think he's going to be back? Is there some type of timetable? And Kirk was pretty much just like, I'm not a doctor or something like, it was something of that sort. There pretty much is no timeline for Keegan Johnson returning, which is not great news for Iowa's team or the fans. And um, just me personally, at this point, I'm just kind of assuming that he is out until we see him warming up on a, on a Saturday. That's um, just kind of where, where I'm at with it. It just seems like this is one of those things that um, is a fluid situation. It is day by day, but there hasn't seemed to be a lot of progress um, in getting him back on the field. No, not at all. Um... Nico Regini, uh, maybe next week against Nevada, but just me reading the Ferentz tea leaves, uh, Rutgers probably more likely. Um, 
he Ference did say it sometime this month. So <laughs> that would be September 24th, unless he means the week of practice for Michigan. But, um, you know, that's uh, that's kind of where things stand with him. And then uh, uh, Arland brought up Deontay Vines today, just how good he looked at, in camp. And that that is a big injury that nobody's talking about, uh, that wrist injury, the broken wrist. So he's out for a long time yet. Uh, maybe he'll come back later. But right now, Regani is probably the most near future guy. Um, and then Brody Brecht, what can he bring to the table? I, I asked about him to Spencer and, and Ferentz said the same thing. Conditioning is his biggest problem right now because he missed so much time. Yeah. He, Ferentz, he pretty much did, couldn't do much, um, if anything, during spring practice because he was locked into his baseball season. He missed um, all of fall camp last year with a broken hand, and that really set him back um, in terms of getting a chance to develop throughout the fall. And it seems like just kind of reading the the tea leaves, like you said, of what Ferris says, it seems like probably like late last week, but really this week was when he started to practice consistently. And I think that's what led to him ending up on the two deep. So it's just a matter of can he play 10 snaps, 15 snaps? 20, what is exactly going to be his workload? I mean, he might have played. He played more one. Than one. He played maybe more than one, but I think just officially one, one, yeah. one on, on, on Saturday. So can <laughs> Can we get? Can we go from one to ten? Can we <laughs> yeah, right. From one to eight. I think that if I were to get into the red zone one or a few times, that would be the probably the best time to put him out there. That big body receiver that they haven't had in the program for um, you know some time now. So um, I'll be interested to see what happens with him. We did not ask about Jacob Bostic's status, um, so he'll be a surprise this weekend whether he, he plays or not. But um, if he can be out there, then that's just another body that they can kind of throw out there into the receiver rotation and maybe have a little bit more, uh, if not creativity in their play calling, at least like diversify the uh, the offensive looks a little bit. Hey, uh, five years ago, Iowa introduced a very, very skinny, true freshman wide receiver against Iowa State. His name was Amir Smith-Marset. He happened to score the walk-off overtime touchdown in that 44-41 game in overtime at, at Jack Trice Stadium. So who knows? Maybe Jacob Bostic becomes that, you know, sneaks onto the field and makes a big catch on Saturday. All right, Kennington, third down. Uh, let's stick on the offensive side of the ball. we got to talk about the offensive line because when I went through the DVR Monday film, every single offensive lineman had a bad game. Uh, we talked about it on the post game as well, but – yeah, you know, you found it was just a tough game to watch for the offensive line. I can't remember an offensive line performance that bad uh, since maybe the Michigan game in 2019. So it was bad. And uh, Ferris talked about it a little bit today. Uh, a lot of rookie jitters out there, but, you know, I kind of, I don't know, like, I guess, I guess, but I just, you know, other teams have a, <laughs> New starters and never looking at that. Uh, I don't know. I'm just I'm starting to wonder about this offensive line coach too. I, I just I'm not seeing a lot there from George Barnett, and he's making seven hundred thousand dollars a year. I got to see more from this offensive line. Yeah, one hundred percent. I think that when you look at the group in itself, the when you talk about the first game jitters, which was something that Mason Richmond talked about extensively today, and Kirk kind of um, compounded that when talking about Logan Jones specifically. But the point over the whole line is that. Four of their five original starters were either first-time starters or starting in a new position for the first time. I think that one of the biggest things, and now I'm talking about Logan Jones specifically, was, um, and you you could probably see it live, but uh, on the playback it was fairly obvious that the cadence was just not right, and there were a lot of times where there were linemen kind of misfiring or the snap was a little bit slow. Um, the timing just wasn't right from the beginning, and I think that that um, – affected a lot of their plays just from the start. I mean, if you can't get the cadence and the snap right, then you're just – you're behind the eight ball before the play can even develop. So Kirk said that he expects that that won't be as big of an issue this week. He said that he chalked a lot of that up to just, like you said, first game jitters, a lot of things that they can't really simulate in practice that were a difficulty for, for Logan Jones. Um, but for me, I'm thinking about this offensive line grouping and what exactly can be done to quick fix the offensive line. I don't think that is going to magically be better overnight. And 
from my position, it's just a matter of what can you do week to week to just try mm -hmm. to win the game. And I think right. that, um, you know, I know we're going to, I guess this is like a segue into kind of like how we can quick fix things. But um, in my opinion, I feel like it starts with putting Connor Colby back at right guard. Oh, man. I was I, last week on this podcast, I was like, Connor Colby's got to play on right tackle. But uh, now I, I might be with you. I would just, uh, we'll see. I, uh, they, the depth chart this week uh, lists Jack Plum at right tackle and Tyler Ellsbury at left guard. Neither guy <laughs> played. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was the weirdest corrected depth chart I've ever seen. But uh, uh, basically removed Keegan Johnson and restored last week's pregame offensive line, which never materialized. So I asked uh, Steve Rowe, the SAD, is this the correct depth chart? He said, yes, that's what the coaches gave me for this week. So that wasn't a mistake. That's the one the coaches supplied. We have, I would say we have no idea, you know, at this point what they're going to do, which is probably what they want. They don't want Iowa State to know what they're going to do on the O-line, where they can attack with, uh, you know, Will McDonald out there. Um, Whew, I don't know. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, Colby didn't have a good game either. I mean, I'm not dogging on anybody. They all play bad. Um, everybody in offense played bad except Darlin Bruce, I would say. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, clean slate, clean slate. We're going to talk more about big picture stuff tomorrow on the radio show. But I do not see a quick fix. I think you made a great point, Kennington. It's going to have to be piecemeal week to week. Uh, I think they can get there. You know, Logan Jones did some things. Logan Jones had some rough moments too. So I think that's a good a good start. Jennings Dunker was actually the highest rated O lineman by PFF. Kind of interesting. Maybe, you know, could they put Dunker out there a little bit more? Maybe. That might not be a bad idea. Um, I didn't I didn't think uh, either guard played well at all, but again, uh, it was week one. Not gonna give much of a pass though for for 166 yards. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm looking really at the interior of the line as the the grouping that probably had the worst day of all for looking at it from the outside or the, the inside, which is my point about putting Connor Colby back at right guard. Like I said, Iowa State is a much more dangerous team than South Dakota State. If it gets to a point where you see your offensive line is getting overwhelmed early, you have to put Carter back at right guard where he's played the most games. He might have the highest ceiling at right tackle, but this is about winning this game specifically. Put him back at right guard. Jack Plum is the oldest on the offensive line by age. He's played a lot. Kirk said today that he's played a lot of good football. They know a lot about him. I feel like you're going to have to trust him and put him back at, at right tackle and just see what, what happens. And if yeah, Jimmy Tucker – and if Jenny Dunker was the the highest rated um, guard, I would put him at put him at left guard, and then have Richmond and Jones, and that would probably be my that would probably be my five. Just based on all the factors, that would be my starting lineup. Um, and I guess that's all I have to say <laughs> about about that. Hey, you make good points. You make a good point, and uh, I, you know I thought Dunker looked pretty good uh, on the kids' day scrimmage. You know, Kirk said basically him and Bo Stevens, both the redshirt freshmen, were injured all of last year. So this is really their first foray into Iowa football. So they're going to get better. Uh, but, you know, they needed to be better last week and they weren't. Um, we'll see. I, I'm uh, I'm in agreement, Kennington, that the offense is going to do – is going to be better this week. It can't, obviously, it can't be much worse. <laughs> but I – you know, I've seen this before. We can end on this point. I've just seen this before from Kirk Ferentz teams. You count them out, and they they rally the troops. They find a way. I'm not going to say they're – I'm not ready to make my score prediction just yet, but they. I would be shocked if the offense doesn't do something, have some answers. Iowa State's got a good defense, but uh, I don't know. I'm just curious to see what it's going to look like. That's. I mean, it's yeah. the story right now. It was yeah. the story of the offseason. Now it is really the story of week two. Yeah, and it's timely that we get Brian Ferentz as our assistant coach on Zoom tomorrow. So get a chance to ask him some questions about what they're thinking schematically. So that'll be uh, – that's a very timely assistant coach um, Zoom. But I agree with you. I mean, even past the offensive line, 
I think that there could have been first game jitters for pretty much everybody on the offense stepping into um, a starting or a new role. Deshaun Williams getting his first start, Alec Wick getting his first start, Jack Johnson playing for the first time. Brody Breck only played one play, but that was his first game action as well. So if you take everybody who started the first time that has position and you take it away, that has to be at least like a 25% improvement. Um, then we'll see about the rest in terms of the execution phase. <laughs> All right, Hawk fans, we'll see how many points the Hawkeyes score, whether they win the game. Uh, it'll be a, uh, quite the interesting storyline. I'm excited to see what unfolds Saturday at Kinnick Stadium. Uh, could get ugly, but it could be one of those days where you're feeling good again about the Hawkeye football program. All right, thank you, Kennington Smith, for Chad Lysico. Staying so long and see you on, uh, talk to you Wednesday night, Hawk Central Radio Show. Take care.